My name is Eric Hemker. I'm 29 years old and I'm a design engineer. I design seat structures for cars and it's very important because if that person's not comfortable, they're not gonna buy that car. Same thing goes for a knife. If that is not comfortable, they're not gonna wield that knife. My name is Dave Armour and I am from Auburn, Illinois. I got into bladesmithing when I was 15. I went to a theme park where they had a gun and knife shop and a man was demonstrating how to make a knife. I, being 15 and just being fascinated, I followed him into his shop and asked so many questions. He literally took a book on knife making that was for sale, threw it at me and said, get the hell out of the shop. Hi, I'm Martin Sack, I'm 52 years old. I started training in martial arts in 1975. I'm a senior professor in the art of American Kempo Karate, and that's kind of what led me to the bladesmithing portion of it. I want to recreate ancient martial arts weaponry. It just kind of goes hand in hand. My name is Jimmy Riley. I'm 33, and I am a full-time welding teacher at my local high school. I love my welding instructor job. The opportunity to teach the next generation and inspire them into making things is the greatest thing that I've ever done. Bladesmiths, welcome to the forge. We've got three very intense rounds of bladesmithing competition for you. At the end of each round, you're gonna present your work to our panel of expert judges. The men behind me are the ones who will decide which one of you is gonna be leaving here carrying the title of Fortune Fire Champion and pockets full of $10,000. Today, they are ABS Master Smith Jay Nielsen, Historic Weapons Recreation Specialist Dave Baker, and Edge Weapon Specialist Doug Markaida. Bladesmiths, throughout history, there have been cultures that have truly immersed themselves in the artistry that is bladesmithing. Today in The Forge, we're gonna be highlighting the Korean heritage. Every aspect of this competition, we're gonna be honoring their culture, whether it's the tests, the techniques, or the weapons we're having you build. As you can see next to me, we have a yin-yang on the floor. The yin-yang represents the delicate balance between two opposing forces. When it comes to bladesmithing, there are no two opposing forces that hold more importance than fire and water. Behind each of you, there is a water tank. The Koreans have mastered the art of the water quench, an extremely delicate process that, when done properly, ends with an extremely strong and durable blade. If you make a mistake, You'll end up with cracks, with fissures, or a blade that could just shatter. In this competition, we have gotten rid of the oil buckets. We're going to ask for a water quench. Oh, crap. It's very dangerous to quench in water. You can get a crack. You can get a warp. You can get a crack and a warp. Many, many things can go wrong. You're probably wondering, what am I going to be quenching in water? We want you to build this. The Huando Sword. The Huando was a single-edged, battle-worthy sword of the Korean military during the Chosun Dynasty between the 12th and 19th centuries. During the Imjim War, the sword was modified and forged to sharper and longer to battle the invading Japanese. The Huando's lightweight and compact size provided the Korean warriors with a fast and effective weapon capable of delivering cuts with precision and ease of recovery. Although the size and form differed in diverse periods, the single-edged, slightly curved blade is constant. It is prominently used in the recent Netflix hit series, Kingdom. Now, gentlemen, here to tell you about it is the bladesmith who made this blade, an extremely talented Korean-American bladesmith who just so happens to also be a Forge and Fire champion, Boyd Ritter. I really wanted to build the Huando because there's a lot of versatility in this sword. It is designed as a secondary weapon for close quarter combat. It's a very sleek weapon, but the action is incredible. It's been enriching to dig into my own heritage a little bit, learning all of this history and, and realize that you're a part of it. It's just been really cool. Guys, we want you to recreate this blade down to the finest of details. In order for you to be set up for round two, we're going to be supplying you with the hibakis. On your workstations, we have supplied you with W1 steel, which you must use to make your Huando swords. Moving into round two, you're going to add handles to your blades, turning them into fully functioning weapons, at which point the judges are going to be testing for strength and durability in a wax wood staff attack and for edge retention in a rubber tube slice. You have three hours on the clock, so good luck. Your time starts now. This is going to be fun. So we asked these guys to make Boyd Ritter's Wando. That's a gorgeous piece. 
It must have been fun for Boyd doing something from his own cultural history. You could probably get at least three of these wandos out of that chunk of steel. So I'm going to start out with half of it. I have zero experience with any sort of Eastern Asian blades of any kind, but as an engineer, one of the strengths that we have to do is develop strategies to overcome a problem. Is this a ceremonial blade or is this no. a fighting weapon? It's a fighting weapon during the Joseon period in Korea. The Koreans were more militaristic where they saw the sword as a tool. Jimmy has got his steel cut in half and in the forge, and he just got a sliver off what's left of the W1 he had. I have never attempted a water quench, but I know that it's going to introduce tons of cracks. I don't want any of that to happen, so I test it. W stands for water. It's a more forgiving metal to be quenched in water. But that's a very smart move on Jimmy's part. If you haven't done this before, do your trial and error right now. When I put it in the vise and cinch it down, it breaks under the pressure of the vise. That's not real easy. I know immediately that the steel is very brittle out of the quench. I'm going to have to thermocycle my blade a couple times before I quench it. They gave us a really large piece of steel, but I'm not sure how much of it I need for a piece. So I'm going to just forge out off of it as much as I need. After that first heat, you're going to be able to draw that cylinder out the length of this blade, then cut it to shape. I've worked with W1. It's forgiving, but it's also got a little bit of trick. You get a little too cold or a little too hot, or you get a little aggressive hitting it, you're going to have some problems. My game plan is to draw the steel out almost to the full length I need it to be, and then work on the width parameters. I have some experience in Korean martial arts, but I've never made a Wando sword before. This is a fairly simple shape of a knife. If you look at the spine, it's virtually straight until the end where it has a bit of a up kick at the tip. That's in my wheelhouse. I understand these blades. I own several of them, and I feel that I'll be able to replicate that. As an engineer, it's very important to leave myself enough room to be able to make the next step even that much more precise. It looks like Eric has a piece of quarter-inch steel as a stopper in the press. Well, that's a smart idea. The kiss block on the die of the press makes it really easy for me to draw out the steel to a quarter-inch thickness. It's just going to save me that much time down the road instead of having to forge it way thicker and grind it all back or forge too thin and not be able to make the blade as thick as I would like. Doug, you're always talking about forging thick, grinding thin. Would this be a time when they would want to forge it to shape pretty thick so when they go in the water quench, it doesn't shock the inside and then grind it down? Yes. Feeling good? Looking good. Blade Smith, you're down to two hours remaining in round one. I'm trying to only work the first half of the cylinder. That way, if I really screw it up and I have to cut off, I can just start pressing that down and lengthening the piece that I've already got. Yeah, I'd be putting that back in a fire, especially on a water quench. You don't want to work the steel too cold, because you could actually pound stress fractures into the steel that will open up when it hits the water. The big challenge with this round is everything has to be dialed in. So I'm going to take my time, double check things, and hopefully get it right. Now that the billet is a little bit more manageable, I can start to work on the development of the tank. A large part of this challenge, other than the water quench, is the habaki. Yeah. Adding the habaki does add a level of difficulty, because you need to make sure your shoulders are correct so that everything slides up to it and marries nice and tight. Where's the time check, Grady? <laughs> Blake Smith, you guys have 90 minutes remaining. I got to get one of those. Look how thin Jimmy's blade is. My billet's getting pretty long, and the thickness is a little under what I would like it to be, so I go ahead and take off a pretty good size before I actually start shaping the blade. So they give us a habaki, which I am immediately grateful for, because that alone is two or three hours of work. But the catch-22 is that we have to tailor make this blade around an existing piece. He's got a super thin profile blade. 
Yeah, is his blade going to be too thin for that abaki, which is going to force him to make one? All righty. I feel like I've got it drawn out to so the size I need. I'm going to start hammering at the shape. Uh, as I'm working the steel, my arms are tired, my hands are tired. Time to cut it off, start forming the point, and to make this actually look like the sword. Jimmy's blade is still super narrow. So the blade is pretty close to the part where I need to start thermocycling and start thinking about the quench. Oh! Jimmy's blade got so hot, when he's pulling it out, it fell in two. You know how thin that blade had to be for that to happen? Exactly. My heart falls and hits the floor. W1 is one of those steels that, if you do anything to it at too high a temperature, it will stress that metal. I'm about halfway through the clock at this point, and I'm distraught and confused, and I am definitely feeling the heat. There's just nothing left of it. Ah! I'm about halfway through the clock at this point, and my sword melts in half. Ah! Starting over! There is not an ounce of quit in me. All right, all right, all right, all right. Calm down, calm down. Today's challenge is all about balance, yin and yang, you know, peace and storm. So I know that I need to center myself and calm down a little bit. Just a little bit of panic. You got just, it. Just dude. a little bit of panic. Yeah, Eric's blade's looking nice over there. I feel like time's flying by. So at this point, I start the thermal cycles. I know that doing the thermal cycling on this blade is going to at least help with relieving some of that stress before it goes in for the quench. How you doing, Dave? I'm going to try to get this heat halfway even so I can normalize it. All right, Eric and Dave both doing rounds of thermocycling. So if somebody goes and quenches today without doing proper thermocycling, we're going to see cracks. Oh, probably, yeah. yeah. I'd put money on it. Gentlemen, you have one hour remaining. So I start to do my thermocycle on the blade, and I notice because there's a little bit more beef in the tip, it starts to warp. Warping like crazy. I know I need to correct that. I bring it over to the post vise, and I kind of use that very gently just to align everything. I wanted to thermocycle a few more times, but I don't have the time to do that. I need to really focus on fixing this warp. Lord willing, I make it to round two. Guys, if I've learned one thing in this sport so far, it's water quenches are bad. Water quenching is actually a technique that's been used forever. You, know, you can get away with it. You add salt, then you get brine. It makes it a little bit safer. And Dave took like three or four cups of salt and put it in his tank. Adding salt to the water slows down the quench speed a little bit, so I just throw a whole bunch in there, and hopefully I've got enough in it. I really realistically only have one chance to get this quench right. It's not like oil where I can go back and re-quench if I don't get it hard enough. It's do it now. This is the blade I've got. All right, guys, hold on to your butts. Here it goes. Drum roll, everyone. Oh, yeah, do it, do it, do it, do Here it. we go. Straight. Nice. Now we just got to find out if I really cracked it. All right, well, Jimmy drew that steel down pretty quickly. That's good. Yeah, about three times faster than he did the first round. Not bad for 40 minutes. Jimmy's blade is so thin, he's bending it with the wire brush to clean the scale oh, off. Oh, my goodness. Jimmy's doing the exact same thing exactly he did last time. Exactly the same. I'm ready for the quench. I'm hoping that it works. I just don't have enough time to start a third billet. Go, go, go. There we, there are. we go. Number two. Jimmy's quench. As it's starting to cool down a little more, the back end is starting to warp a little bit. So I clamp it up and give it the slightest amount of pressure. Oh, that he just had to hop in. Oh, man. Damn it. Get to the welder, man. Get to the welder. I don't have enough time to start over, but I'm going to do everything I can to make a blade. I don't even wait for it to cool off. I'm a welding instructor. I figure I might as well do what I'm good at. Man, I feel for Jimmy. This is so brutal. I add a layer of clay to the spine in hopes that it will keep the spine nice and soft. So when they're doing any chopping challenges, it'll be more resistant to shock. Fingers crossed the quench should go well. 
Eric's giving it a good file check. Moment of truth. Nice. I am successful. So I know time is running out. I'm going to edge quench it. Oh, 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 oh. That was hot, Blade. This is where you worry about hearing that tink. Oh, and there it happened. A crack. My heart drops. I notice that there's a crack on the blade. It's not that surprising. Martin quenched a very high temperature. Do you think if there's one crack, there's going to be more? Usually. I ain't got it in me to do anything else. I think Martin's tapping out. I feel like it's an issue that I know I can potentially fix later. I have something to turn into the judges at this point, and I don't want to press my luck any further. Well, he's got a quenched and hardened blade, so as long as he's within parameters, he's still in the running. Five, four, three, two, one. Gentlemen, round one is over. Even though the blade broke in half, the welds came out all right, so I'm thinking I might have this. I've seen people come back from worse. Gentlemen, in the first three hours of this competition, we asked you to recreate Boyd Ritter's Wando sword and then do something we've never asked Smith to do before, a water quench. And you all have blades to turn in, so every one of you has something to be proud of. But this is a competition, which means there have to be eliminations. Time has come for our first critique. And Eric, you're up first. Please present your work. Eric, right off the bat, looking at this, the steel looks really good. And you did all the prep work that I like seeing to get that grain structure down tight so you have fewer problems in the quench. Right now, you don't have clearly defined shoulders on the spine of this blade. So if you move forward, the biggest thing I see is how you're going to set up for the habaki, the guard handle, and all that. But other than that, well on your way. Nice and done. Thank you. Dave, you're up next. You ready? Yes, sir. Please present your work. Dave, you do have a couple issues. You do have a couple cracks right on the edge, and they kind of come up and curve back. So if you move into the next round, I'd address those so this thing doesn't come flying apart. But the rest of the blade looks pretty solid, and you left yourself some good sacrificial material to deal with, so good job on that. Thank you. Martin, how are you feeling? Feeling OK, thank you. Please present your work. The profile you have here isn't bad at all, but your knife has a little bit of a warp, as you can see, sir. But the really big thing that I see with your weapon right here is that you have two visible cracks. One goes right across the edge, but this one down here actually is open where I can see right through that. You definitely have to take care of that. Jimmy, you ready? I am. Please present your work. Jimmy, you did something that I would really like to see, which was testing the material. And in testing the material, you found out it was pretty brittle. So after coming out of that quench, all I was thinking is, ah, we're going to see that again. And we did. There are multiple cracks along this edge that are very small. And any one of those can be the, the stress riser that breaks these blades. But uh, got a good shape going there. You never gave up. Good job. Thank you, sir. Gentlemen, we gave you a very difficult task in the first round of this competition. You should all be proud of yourselves. But only three of you can move forward. The judges have made the decision, and the bladesmith leaving the forge is Martin. Martin, you developed a warp and an extreme curve in that blade that actually peeled your steel apart, and you've got wide open cracks. That's why we're letting you go. I understand. Martin, you fought hard, but unfortunately, I have to ask you to please surrender your work and leave the forge. The competition is very tough. It is definitely no joke. But I had so much fun, I can't even tell you. I feel like I have to go home and try the water quench from the house. Well, gentlemen, congratulations. The three of you have made it through into the second round of our competition, where you're going to fix any issues you have with your blades and add handles to them, turning them into fully functioning weapons. Now, we asked you to recreate Boyd Ritter's Wando sword. So, in this round, your handles are no different. You need to include a hibaki, a guard, a wrap handle. And at the end of this round, the judge is going to test for strength and durability in a wax wood staff attack. Then we're going to check for edge retention in a rubber tube slice. You guys have two hours on the clock to complete all that. Good luck. Your time starts now. All right, so we've got cracks. Dave has some serious cracking issues yeah. that he's got to clear up. 
A crack on the edge is a death sentence to a knife because as soon as you hit it, it's gone, it's two pieces. What I'm doing is opening up deeper surface area so that I can fill in those welds and then grind it off as I shape the edge. The key question is, are they able to fix those cracks and really support it? That's ugly, but it's fixed temporarily. Jimmy over here had a blade that broke in half, was welded. It's also got multiple cracks along the edge. I've got a bunch of cracks to take care of, so I start opening the biggest ones possible so I can weld them together. My biggest concern in this round is not getting all the cracks welded up. Now that I've got the spine welded up, I've got my edge welded up. All I can do is hope that my blade survives that strength test. Man, that's ugly. Dave mentioned he has concerns about how my hibaki is going to fit up, so I need to grind him shoulder on the top and match the angle on the bottom. The hibaki, when you put it on the blade, should be somewhat tight. So just getting it fit up and hoping that it's a tight fit. Eric's fitting up his hibaki, and it looks pretty tight. After I get my guard fitted, I grab three pieces of green G10. Dave looks like he's actually making a frame handle. I'm cutting the middle piece of G10 to fit around the tang, and then I'm going to put a piece of G10 on either side of it, secure it with a pin, and that's what's going to hold everything in place. This is the quickest way I could think of to do a handle. Cord, 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 cord. All right, guys, you have one hour remaining. Thank you, sir. I've got my scales ready to go, and my garden hibaki are all fitted up, and I'm starting to feel pretty good. It's a shame to cover up this nice chunk of wood. All right, Jimmy's starting his rep. I don't have a lot of time to spend on it, so I'm choosing the easiest way to wrap it as tight as I can in a spiral fashion. So now that I've got the handle material wrapped and tucked in, the last thing I have to do is get this pommel on there, get the tang peened over. Ideally, for peening over a tang, you would add some heat, but with the paracord and the handle material 3 eighths of an inch away, I don't feel comfortable adding heat. Oh, it didn't work. Getting this tang peened over is taking me a lot longer than I would like to. My arm's starting to get tired. I think what's happening is you tried to peen over with too much material. So you're really not moving the material the way you want it to. I'm stuck using the peen of my hammer to spread this material, and it's just not going as quickly as I would like. I don't think there would be any saving my handle if I can't make this work. Oh, my goodness. Well, right now, Eric has to solve the problem with his butt cap. It still looks very loose. Thankfully, I finally get it secured. There's about 20 minutes left in the competition, and I just got to make sure that my blade is nice and sharp, and it's going to cut anything that they throw at it. With this knife, I'm going to try to do a pretty blunt convex edge. It's going to be sharp, but not that sharp so it'll have a little bit more insurance against it breaking. We'll see what happens. Oh. What? As I grind on it, I'm seeing more and more cracks. Oh, hell. Because of how thin the blade is, it's a little more delicate than I would hope it to be. There's nothing else I can do. I'm hoping that it holds together. Five, four, three, Two, one. Gentlemen, round two is over. I'm overall happy with how I did. The handle is not my best work, but it does feel comfortable in the hand, so I'm happy. Bladesmiths, welcome to our strength test. The waxwood staff attack. That's going to test how your heat treat worked out and the overall construction of your weapons. Sound like fun? Let's do it. Yeah. Such enthusiasm. <laughs> Eric, you're first. You ready to go? Let's see what she's got. All right, let's do it. Water quench is a very vigorous and very aggressive quench. This could definitely snap my blade right in half.
Eric, Eric, you survived. Nice job. Um, you did pick up a bend, but you have no damage to your edge whatsoever. Proof of concept that a water quench is a viable method. So good job. Thank you. Dave, you're up next. You ready? No. <laughs> well, we're going to do it anyway. OK. After watching Eric's blade just get beat on under those staffs, all I can think of is Jay's about to go full Nielsen. This is not going to be pretty. Damn. Oops. Yeah. <laughs> actually, don't feel bad about this. Your grain structure is actually not bad. It's slightly coarse. It's not quite that gray velvet you want. But once I hit it, the shock traveled into this fracture right here. But your overall construction, everything is tight. You turned in something viable. Just didn't make it through this test. Yep. Hate to see it, Dave, but you did suffer a catastrophic failure during the first swing on the waxwood staff. But you're not out of the fight yet. Now, Jimmy, you have to survive one strike on the waxwood staff to move forward in this competition. You ready? I am ready. All right, let's do it. Jay? I am feeling so much pressure. This is literally a make or break moment, and uh, I'm just hoping and praying. Uh, Jimmy, we got several pieces, and you can see on each one, there's dark spots, or there are cracks in the blade. Damn. The grain structure is really, really big. But again, the water quench, you fought hard, so you gotta be proud of that. Thank you, sir. Eric, you are moving forward into the third round, so congratulations. Now, gentlemen, it came down to two broken blades, but only one of you guys is moving forward in this competition. And the bladesmith leaving the forge is... Jimmy. Jimmy, first off, I commend you for that work you did in the first round. You did not give up at all. That's something to be proud of. When it came to this break, it was one blade broke in one spot. Your blade literally shattered. And that's no longer a viable blade there, and that's why we're letting you go. I understand. Well, Jimmy, unfortunately, you're not going to be moving forward in this competition. And I'm going to have to ask you to please step off the forge floor, man. Thank you all. It's been an honor. I was hoping to survive one strike, but unfortunately not. Even though I didn't win, I know that I am a damn good smith, and I can make a blade worth wielding. Eric, Dave, congratulations, gentlemen. You guys have solidified yourself spots in our third and final round of this competition. Now, in this final round, we're going to be sending you guys back to your home forges to build yet another iconic weapon from Korean history. We're going to have you build this. The Woldo. The Waldo is a polearm weapon that has been wielded by Korean warriors since the 6th century. The large crescent blade provided the user with incredible force that delivered lethal blows and deep cuts with one swing into an opponent. Historically, this heavy weapon required special skills and was only wielded in battle by elite Korean warriors. Today, Korean martial artists who specialize in the Waldo perform intricate maneuvers with this intimidating weapon at festivals and cultural events. Now, guys, your blades need to measure between 22 and 24 inches. You need to feature a peak on the spine. You guys also need to feature a guard and a 50 to 52 inch pole arm. The good news is the water quench is behind you. So you guys can forget about that. You can choose to quench however you want. That weapon is big. I've never finished a blade this long. I have made a blade this long, and it broke upon testing. So hopefully this one will go much better. All right, gentlemen, we're giving you four days to build your world of swords, and I want to see your best work, because one of them will be worth $10,000. We'll see you in four days. 
I'm back here in my home forge in Detroit. Excited to get the forge fired up and start going on this wall dough. Look at that. This thing's going to be almost as tall as I am. That's pretty frightening. So I'm to the point where I've got the blade forged out. I have to cut a notch and use a chisel to open it up. And there we go. The wall dough is in good shape. I got plenty of meat on there that I can grind back and get to the shape I'm looking for. We're back here in Auburn, Illinois. My goal for the day is to have the rough shape forge and to have a solid piece when I'm done for the day. This is a little outside of my comfort zone. This has some weird curves and peaks to it that's gonna be a bit of a forging challenge. I may have ruined this early on. I forged the piece over, so actually the top part is actually folding over on itself. It's called a cold shut. It causes all kinds of problems later on because the pieces aren't attached. I go over the grinder. If I can grind out, I'm not too bad. But if it's really deep or it's something I can't fix, I'm screwed. Day two, rough brand is done. So here I am, a man asking for all the bladesmiths of the universe to send me their good juju. That is a hard blade. Overall, good quench. Day two, today my goal is to get the bevels in, get it ground and get it heat treated. I do see one problem that's opened up on me. I've got a real problem. Apparently when I ground that cold shut out, I didn't get it completely ground out and it folded over a little bit. If it goes deep into the steel, then I'm probably in bad shape. If it runs all the way through, then the blade's ruined and I gotta start over. So I'm trying to figure out what I can do. Is it something I can repair, or am I just plain old screwed and it's time to start again? So right now, it's just back to the grinder. Good news is everything's solid. The cold shut I was worried about is grinding out. I have a blade ready to heat treat. I'm straight. Yep, and it's hard. That's as good as I can hope for right now. Day three. So today I have to make the shaft and then get everything put together. So I decide as a little decorative embellishment to add a little grip to the handle. I'm gonna flute and inlay some paracord. And I'm using imperial red and royal blue to honor the colors of the Korean flag. Ooh, nice. I'm looking pretty good going into day four, so I'm pleased. Day four, yesterday I got the blade finished and I've got the shaft shaped and roughed in. So today it's a lot of fit, finish, assembly, and just putting the final touches on my weapon. So I grabbed some pink paracord that I'm gonna use to wrap the areas between the collars. And then I have a pink wood stain that I'm going to stain the hickory with. When I do a knife show, I always have one knife on my table that has a pink handle. It's not the typical looking thing, but I think it looks kind of neat, so I'm gonna go with it. I think this is a solid piece. I think it'll test well, but we're gonna see what happens. Gentlemen, welcome back to The Forge. You guys had four days to work on your Korean Waldos and they look great, but we want to hear about your builds. Eric, how'd it go for you? Overall, went really well. Made the blade out of oil-quenched W1, mild steel collars, paracord wrap, and wrought iron guard and pommel. Fantastic. Dave, how'd your build go? It went pretty well. The blade is 5160, the handle is hickory, and it has copper collars and a paracord wrap. Well, gentlemen, both your blades look deadly, but there's only one way for us to find out if they function as well as they look. We've got a strength test, a sharpness test, and up first, the kill. Doug? Bladesmiths, 안녕하세요, and welcome to the kill test. To find out what kind of lethal damage your weapons will do, I will take your weapons and deliver lethal blows on this ballistics dummy. Eric, you're up first. You ready for this? Yes, sir. Right, let's do this. Bones are dense. They can do some damage to an edge, so my heart's racing. All right, Eric, let's talk about your Waldo here. 
It is forward heavy. There's a lot of metal in here, but it is wieldable. Now, your edge is sharp. It penetrates deeply into this Blixus dummy, cutting the gel torso and into the bones. Overall, sir, you're a Waldo. It will kill. Thank you. All right, Dave, your turn, sir. You ready? Yes, sir. Let's do this. I'm looking at this ballistics dummy right now, and it's a hard test. If I messed up on this blade, that dummy's gonna show it. And if it works well, parts go flying. <laughs> All right, Dave, let's talk about your Waldo here. It is a little bit heavier than the other weapon. Heavier weapons require a lot of adjustments, but your edge here is sharp. With this forward weight that cuts deep into this ballistic dummy and cuts the bones inside. But in doing so, sir, your edge over here did take a little bit of rolling. But the other parts are fine. And overall, sir, your Waldo will kill. Thank you. All right, gentlemen, you know what time it is. It's time for the strength test. We're calling this one the Bamboo Man Attack. To test the overall construction of your blade, I'm going to take them and gently tap them against our Bamboo Man over here. <laughs> <laughs> now, remember, this is not about what your weapons do to these targets. It's about what these targets do to your weapons. Eric, you're up first. You ready? Yes, sir. All right. Bamboo is a very hard wood, and it can definitely take some chips out of an edge. And also, with this long of a handle on it, it could just snap it in two. So Eric, right off, this is a heavy beast. Your balance point's not bad. I kind of like that right there, where you can manipulate the weapon. As far as the weapon performance goes, you maintain an edge all the way along. It's still sharp. Nice and done. Thank you. All right, Dave, you're up. You ready? Yes, sir. All right, Dave, your weapon is really, really heavy. So you can make a devastating cut, but recovery is, is really slow. As far as the blade, the blade itself is, is dented sideways here and up above here, but still solid. So you survived quite nicely. Well done, Dave. Thank you. Bladesmiths. This is the sharpest test, the sugarcane slice. To find out how sharp your weapons are, I'm gonna attempt to cut through all these sugar canes. Unlike the strength test, this is all about what your weapons do and how well they cut the sugar canes. Eric, are you ready to do this? Yes, sir. All right, Eric, let's talk about your edge here. Your edge, it's sharp. It cuts through all the sugar canes. And overall, sir, your weapon, it will cut. Thank you. Dave, it's your turn, sir. You ready for this? Yes, sir.
All right, Dave, let's talk about your weapon here. It's still sharp and it cuts cleanly all the way through, but the weight of your blade as I'm cutting dragged downward and I ran out of sugar cane. But overall, sir, your weapon, it will cut. Thank you. Well, gentlemen, you both performed extremely well in our Korean theme challenge. Both your Waldos did great during our tests, but this is a competition and there has to be a winner. The judges have made the decision and today's Forge and Fire champion is... Eric, congratulations. Now, Dave, you fought hard, but unfortunately, you're not today's winner, and Dave's gonna tell you why. Dave, your blade did great in the kill test and it did well in the sharpness test. What this came down to are two things, the overall weight of your blade and the damage it took in the strength test. Those are the reasons we're letting you go. I understand, thanks for having me. Well, Dave, it's clear you have what it takes to fight in this forge. You're an extremely talented smith. But unfortunately, your time in this competition has ended. And for that reason, I'm going to have to ask you to please step off the forge floor. Good job, man. I got a ton out of this experience. I met some great people. I got to play with some techniques and types of weapons I would normally not do. And I had a blast doing it. So I can't complain at all. Well, Eric, you know what that means? You are the newest Forge of Fire champion. You're going to be walking out of here with a check for $10,000. Congratulations. I feel awesome coming out here, winning the competition, having my skills validated. This is a crowning achievement of mine. Well done. Thank you. If somebody wants me to make a wall dough, it's going to cost them 10 grand. 